Hello and welcome. So far in our sequence of videos, we've talked about k-means, we've talked about hierarchical clustering, we've talked about k-mendoids, db scan, and Gaussian mixture model. You might be wondering, while you understand the logic behind these clustering techniques, it would be nice if you are able to see something related to how the end output looks like. And it's always a challenge to be able to visualize that data because you are not dealing with one or two variables, you're dealing with multiple variables. To solve this problem of visualization, there is one dimension reduction technique which comes handy. And this technique is known as T-stochastic neighbor embedding, T-SNE. What does it do? It tries to project a high dimensional data to a relatively lower dimensional space while preserving the pairwise similarities between the data points, which means the relative distance between the data points are maintained while you're trying to project a high dimensional data to a lower dimension data. This is not a linear technique like principal component analysis. And this focuses more on the local neighborhood. Whereas PCA, if you studied, it focused on the overall data. You were extracting principal component one and two, and thereafter focusing on the overall data, how much information you can extract. On the other hand, as the name goes, it's more of a neighbor embedding. So it's focusing more on the local structure and trying to give you an output. It's not a transformation on the data like PCA, which is coming up as an output that you can further work on. It is only going to be used for visualization purposes. Now let's understand how do we apply this with the help of code. So we will go over all the clustering techniques that we have learned so far and see how TSNE helps us visualize them. Let's get started. All right, so I'm at Google Collaboratory right now and I've already opened multiple sessions so that I can just walk you through the step-by-step -step process. We will go through the complete step-by-step -step process for one type of clustering, and for the rest, it's just the similar execution, just the labels are changing. For example, you are storing the labels to begin with as k-means, which later on becomes hierarchical, and then medoid, then Gaussian mixture, and db scan, and so on and so forth. So we've been talking about this data right from the beginning, which is a college survey data. We've done the complete data preparation. Those steps stay intact. We are not going to change any of those steps for TSNE. It's, it's all going to stay the same. It's only once the clusters are achieved is when TSNE comes into action. So if you've not followed the previous videos, you may want to follow the sequence of videos and you'll be then up to date. So TSNE will take charge of the situation from this point on. What are we doing here? We are importing the TSNE class from the scikit-learn manifold module and we are calling Plotly Express for visualization. This is a little better visualization, a little advanced visualization compared to Matplotlib and Seaborn. So we'd want to use this here. Just like we instantiate principal components, we can instantiate TSNE also. We have to mention a number of components. Now, number of components is basically going to be the number of dimensions to which the data will be reduced. If you realize our data originally had multiple columns. So we had 11 columns to begin with. And we are saying that we want to project this to only two dimensions to begin with. And later on, we'll do to a 3D as well. We are mentioning a random state because TSNE is stochastic in nature. As the name goes, stochastic means it's random in nature. So if you keep on refreshing your code, you may get different results. That's why this random state will ensure that our results are consistent. Now we are adding two new columns to our prepared data, not the original data, but the cleaned data, which we call as DF treated. The first column would represent first dimension, and the second column would represent the second dimension of TSNE. Where would this come from? When we do a fit transform on TSNE is when we will get these two columns. If I show you the head of the data after executing this line, this is how it looks like. We have two new columns added to our data. Now we are saying we will bring the labels to this data frame too. And because we're going to be using these labels as the color or the hue, we have to convert it to the object type. Now, this is a mandatory requirement for TSNE that if you want to bring the cluster labels as hue, you have to bring them as string or objects. That's what we are doing here. And then we are using the scatter plot from Plotly Express. It's called scatter. We mentioned what do we want on the x-axis. It will be one of those reduced dimensions from TSNE and y-axis would have the other dimension. The hue or the color would be as per the cluster labels. And then we are just mentioning the labels as we want to display on X and Y axis and a title for the plot. We are setting the marker size, which is nothing but the size of the points that we will see. And we don't want any color bar 
So we are just disabling that. Here's the outcome that you get. Now, if you realize it has given a legend where it says cluster one is here, cluster zero is somewhere in between and cluster two is here. And there are some exceptions here. For example, some green dots you see here for cluster two, some blue dot you see here for cluster one. There could be some exceptions. Remember, all these techniques that we discussed, except for DB scan, none of them was capable of handling outliers. So you may have extreme values, which you will end up labeling something or the other. But it kind of suggests that between cluster two and cluster one, there would be cluster zero. Let's see how our raw output was. So if you see, cluster two were the best colleges. Cluster zero were the second in terms of the ratings. And cluster one were the colleges which were the worst. So ideally, we should have cluster two on one side, cluster one on another side, and cluster zero somewhere in between, because that's how we see it in terms of ratings. Cluster one always had the most poor ratings. Cluster two had the best ratings. So between cluster two and cluster one, there has to be a separation. And in between, you will find cluster zero. Is that how we see it here? See, so cluster two and cluster one are separated. And in between, we have cluster zero. Now, there is no meaning of this x-axis, as in you might be wondering that cluster two, if the best, it should be on the right. Now, that's not how the axes are. This is a transformed space that we are looking at. So you should just look at the relative position, not in terms of scale or numbers. So we once again conclude that cluster two on one side, cluster one on another side, and they have the maximum difference. And somewhere in between falls the cluster zero, right? If we were to look at it in 3D, it may be a little difficult to assess at first, but we'll have to exactly do same steps. Well, we are once again going to give the number of components as three, and we are going to run this. It's going to give us three columns instead of two columns because we'll be looking at these labels now. And then we can add the cluster labels to this data frame as well. And then finally, we can do a 3D visualization. There's not much of a change in terms of code. It's pretty much similar. It's just that in case of 3D, you'll also have to pass the third axis, which will be the third dimension in your data, right? And if you look at the output, you will see something like this. You know, this looks a little complex to begin with, but let us see. You know, do you get a sense that somewhere in this 3D, green is on one side, blue is on another side, and red is somewhere in between? And if that is the case, then isn't it something that we saw here as well, right? So it's just a different angle from which we are looking at the 3D. It's kind of conveying the same information. Of course, 3D becomes a little difficult to present and understand because it has a depth element too. If you kind of rotate it a little bit, you'll be able to see that you, you get an impression that, you know, you have more of greens on one side, more of reds in between and blues on another side, right? So it's one and the same thing. Let's just see the output for hierarchical clustering. It's the exact same process that we have followed, and we are going to look at the 2D. Now, if you see hierarchical clustering labels that we got were imbalanced for uh, class two. It was only five colleges that were given this particular class, and remaining two clusters were kind of comparable, right? So if we come back to this, you can see that these are the five labels here for colleges given to cluster two. Then you have this in blue and this in red. And there could be, of course, such cases like, you know, extreme values, which are given one or the other label for sure. So let's understand this here. In this case, again, class two or the label two was the one which was the lagging most. Label one was the best and label three was somewhere in between. So the one should be on one side, two should be on another side, and three should be somewhere in between because this has values in the middle, not as high as one and not as low as two. Is, is that how we're getting it, right? So if you see, it's one and the same thing. So you have cluster two on one side, cluster one on the side, and three is somewhere in between. Just like here, three is somewhere in between. That's how it's supposed to be in terms of that. And once again, if you look at this in a multi-dimensional space, of course, zoom in and you can see that these are the five points here. And here also you get an idea that, and of course, there are places where blue and green are kind of overlapping, but red is largely on one side and it's separated from green and blue is somewhere in between. So again, the logic of clustering was different. It is able to cluster, but the labels could differ. And this is unsupervised learning. So there's nothing right or wrong. You're just exploring the patterns in the data. Then we also discussed the medoids clustering. And this is how the output for medoids, right? So medoid, if you see, is a little different in terms of shape. It's kind of that green is being enveloped by the red points here. Blue is on one side, green is on another side, but green is kind of enveloped by the red points here. That's how we get the output. If I 
show you the 3D visualization for medoids, it looks like this again. So do you get an impression that green and red are kind of mixed up? And blue is on another side, largely. See, blue is kind of separated. Red is coming to the front here and also located at the back. So green is somewhere in between. Blue is on one side and red is enveloping the greens. That's the kind of impression you get here. Okay, let's look at the same thing, the Gaussian mixture model. So when we come to the Gaussian mixture models, again, you can see that Gaussian mixture model was a soft clustering technique, right? So it will be totally flexible with the points kind of overlapping here and there. And you can see that there are some uh, blue points here and some blue points here, green points in between and red points in between. So Gaussian mixture model was a very flexible approach to clustering. And that's why you could see a mix of points everywhere. Once again, remember, Gaussian mixture models too are sensitive to outliers, right? So when you have outliers, they'll be given some or the other label for sure, and it may not be the best label, right? So you could have such exceptions here. And if you look at the 3D, I'll just scroll down a little bit. If you look at the 3D here, what do we see? So we see a lot of mix here, right? So you can see blue is here, blue is here as well. Green is here and green is somewhere here as well. And red is somewhere in between. So you kind of get the same impression, right? So it's, it's more spread out kind of clusters that you see. So far with the conventional techniques like means, medoids, and hierarchical, we were getting a very nice separation. But there could be such data sets where a mix actually makes sense. You know, this point could still belong to the red cluster because of the red Gaussian. And that's what this proves. So the style is very different. Now, finally, we come to dbscan. But dbscan is something we did on a different data set, right? And dbscan was smart enough to be able to point out the outliers with a minus one category. And you can see there are some dots here which have been pointed out as outliers. So we discussed the concept of core points, the boundary points, and the outliers, right? So core points, of course, join the clusters. Their boundary points or the neighbors also join the clusters, but outliers are segregated. And this is what is happening in this particular case. If you recollect the kind of distribution we got, we had about 52 outliers, and this is how the labels work. So if you look at the 3D representation of the same, this data set is different, right? So you can see this forming clusters in a very, very different way, and it's pointing out outliers. Now, you may not be able to visualize and say that why is this point an outlier? Because see, if you, if you look at it like this, it looks like green and blue are all overlapping. But the moment you zoom in, you realize that there's actually a difference, right? So 3D could be a bit confusing to begin with, but you know it, it has worked on the same logic that we discussed in our theory videos earlier, right? So this is a very powerful technique when you have to visualize the data which comes in multiple dimensions. In our case, it was as high as 11 dimensions in some of the data sets, but it has been able to nicely give us an impression on 2D and 3D. 3D with a bit of effort to analyze, but again, if you, if you really understand this, it will be very interesting. Right. Hope you get further clarity on the clustering techniques. We've done it quite a lot so far. Knowing four or five clustering techniques is not something which is very common or everybody does, but we've covered all that and hope you'll be able to apply this at the relevant situations in the real world.